As with most off-road adventures, it's not a straight line from the military Jeep to the Wrangler 4xe that's right next to me. And Jeep itself has taken quite a number of detours over the years. The very first company to give us a civilian Jeep was Willys Overland. They, of course, turned into Kaiser Jeep which was bought by AMC, which was bought by Chrysler Corporation after a dalliance with Renault there and the 50% ownership. Then of course, Daimler Benz came on the scene. We had Daimler Chrysler, Daimler Benz left the scene. We had Chrysler LLC. We then had Chrysler Group. We then had Fiat Chrysler because Fiat came on the scene. And now of course we have a French connection again with Stellantis, the large global conglomerate that now contains not just Jeep, but all the former Chrysler families. The Wrangler is an interesting example of the chicken and egg problem that so often happens in the automotive industry. If you don't have the volume, you can't have the variation. And if you don't have the variation, you probably can't have the volume. That's why we find so many different options and trim levels, etc., in the four-door Wrangler, but not necessarily the two-door Wrangler. Because even though the two-door Wrangler started everything back in the 1980s, only 10% of Wranglers roll off the lot with just two doors. 90% happen like the model that I'm driving right here. And it's this four-door model success that has really caused the resurgence of boxier, more off-roady SUVs that we find in America. Now let's get back to the future of Jeep, the Wrangler 4xe that's right next to me. Even though this represents a tiny fraction of Jeep sales and a small percentage of Jeep Wrangler sales in North America, this is the best-selling plug-in hybrid in the United States now after having been on sale for only a short time. But you'll notice that it doesn't look different than the rest of the Jeep lineup. You can get the plug-in hybrid system in three different trims, Sahara, High Altitude, and Rubicon at the moment, and they all look exactly like the non-hybrid model. So when you take a look at the Wrangler, keep in mind this is an off-road vehicle first. So for better or for worse, basically what Jeep did is they took a Wrangler and they plug-in hybridized it. A lot of vehicles out there that get high fuel economy ratings, they don't simply drop a hybrid system under the hood. They change the aerodynamics of the vehicle, they change the tires, they change the weight of the vehicle, etc. Everything together gives you the 50 or 60 miles per gallon we find in really, really efficient vehicles in North America. That doesn't exactly describe the Jeep. You can see we still have the front fenders that are not connected to the front bumper. You can get the three-piece bumper design in the Rubicon. Aero is obviously not high on the priority list for this vehicle. Highly efficient electrified vehicles also generally adopt sort of a jelly bean shape. Think of a Prius or a Tesla Model 3 or a Tesla Model Y. Their profile is very similar, and that is certainly not the profile of the Wrangler. In fact, there have been zero aerodynamic improvements for this model for the Wrangler 4xe, and we still have the bumper design that's removable if you get the Rubicon model. We have tires that are pretty wide. These are 275 width tires. This is the Sahara model, so these are a little bit more on-road focused than the ones that we find on the Rubicon, but keep in mind, if you buy a Rubicon and you put 35s on it, etc., you're going to be getting pretty terrible fuel economy any way you slice it. And you could have the chance of moving some of that energy consumption over to electricity. And that's the reason that we find this model. Today's Wrangler is an interesting blend of off-road tradition and modern car sales reality. This is one of the very few vehicles in North America to have solid axles front and rear, something that we don't find in the Ford Bronco. That will have an independent suspension up front, and some folks in the off-road community are a little bit concerned about that. This also has available lockers front and rear, one of the very few vehicles in North America that has a locker on the front axle, and even less if you combine the solid front axle and the locker. I think it's really just this and the Mercedes-Benz G-Wagon. I know you will all let me know if I am wrong down there in the comment section. But the modern car sales reality is that people buy four-door Wranglers, and that's why this is 90% of Wrangler sales. But this is not as small and as nimble as previous generation Wranglers have been. The wheelbase in this model is 118.4 inches long. The length is 188.4 inches long, but it still, of course, has a soft top, an available hard top, a powered soft top, the doors come off, the windshield comes off, etc. Proving the point that people don't seem to be interested in off-road vehicles that are quite as small as they used to be, my Jeep Grand Cherokee here, which is obviously really rough around the edges, is seven inches shorter than that Wrangler and has a wheelbase that is quite a bit shorter at 106 inches between the front wheels and the back wheels. For the record, that means that the Wrangler's wheelbase is actually closer to this three-row Dodge Durango than the second-generation Jeep Grand Cherokee. 
Since the two-door Wrangler sells in such low volume, you cannot find the same array of engine options in it that you can in the four-door model. We have a 3.6-liter naturally aspirated V6 engine with or without their e-torque mild hybrid system, a 3-liter turbo diesel if you want one of the torquiest engines in this segment, a 2-liter turbocharged engine, this 2-liter turbocharged plug-in hybrid, there used to be a 2-liter turbocharged mild hybrid as well, and if none of that is enough for you, you can also get the 6.4-liter V8 out of a wide variety of of different FCA products. That produces the most horsepower under this hood. But I'm here to talk about the plug-in hybrid because this is theoretically the future of the Jeep brand and we're going to be seeing a plug-in hybrid version of the Grand Cherokee very, very soon using likely a variant of this same plug-in hybrid system. According to Jeep, they plan to be the most efficient SUV brand in America. Well, that is a little bit tricky, of course, because Jeep and Land Rover are really the only SUV-only brands in North America. So all Jeep has to do is beat Land Rover at the fuel efficiency wars. So we'll see how that goes. This is a 2-liter 4-cylinder turbocharged engine, producing 270 horsepower and 295 pound-feet of torque. The important thing to know is that Jeep didn't really change the 2-liter turbo. It's basically the same one that you can find without the plug-in hybrid system. So they didn't decide to tune this on the Atkinson cycle or make any other fuel economy changes. It's then mated to a 44-horsepower starter motor generator. It's approximately over here in the engine bay that produces 39 pound-feet of torque, and its mission is to generate power when the vehicle is stopped at a stoplight and to start and stop the engine very rapidly. Behind the engine, we have a 134 horsepower electric motor. There were initially some specifications that seemed a little bit wrong from Jeep. Initially, they said it was 181 horsepower. They actually got it backwards. It's 134 horsepower, 181 pound-feet of torque. That's mated to an eight-speed automatic transmission made by ZF of Germany. It's actually built in Germany in the ZF factory, as is the main electric motor. The main change in this transmission is that it does not have a torque converter. Instead, we have the engine, a clutch pack, the electric motor, and then the transmission. So this vehicle can drive electric only for up to 22 miles, thanks to a 17.3 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery pack that is heated and cooled and located in the back of the vehicle. About 15 kilowatt hours of that battery pack is usable. Aside from that, everything else about the Wrangler's drivetrain is exactly the same as the Rubicon, Sahara, or high-altitude models that you might be looking at with the other engine options. So we still have the available locking differentials. We still have two different two-speed transfer cases, a 2.72 to 1 or a 4.0 to 1 model. Charging happens behind this little door right here where we find a J1772 connector. This is the only body change to the Wrangler 4xe because the only other changes can be removed if you wanted to. We have a trail rated badge that's blue, Jeep logo that's blue, and Wrangler Unlimited that's blue. We also have blue tow hooks around the vehicle depending on the version that you get. This will give you 22 miles of electric range at 49 MPGE. This is one of the least efficient electric vehicles you can buy as a consumer today. And then after the battery has been depleted, you'll get 20 miles per gallon combined. That is one to two miles per gallon less than the regular Wrangler with the two liter turbo because of the added weight of the hybrid system. The front seats haven't changed too much for the Wrangler over time. We still have a manual seat design. Logically, you don't want a power seat if you're in a really dusty environment or if you're going to get the vehicle wet. A manual seat just makes a little bit more sense, but I do wish this was perhaps a little bit more adjustable. We do see some slightly more adjustable manual seats out there. We do have a knob, however, to adjust the lumbar support for the driver. We also have a tilt telescopic steering column with a little bit of motion. Thanks to the long wheelbase, this is easily the most comfortable back seat a Wrangler has ever had. I have about three inches of legroom left with this front seat, very comfortably adjusted for me at six feet tall. And the front seats aren't overly thin, so there's definitely a decent amount of cushioning going on up there. Unlike previous generations of Wrangler, that means that you could very easily put a modern rear-facing child seat behind an adult male sitting up front and very easily get away for a weekend of fun with the entire family included. Let's go for a quick spin around the interior. You can see the module right there for the radar adaptive cruise control system. We also have the buttons for the integrated telematic system. This one again has the soft top which has been completely folded right back there. We have this large bar that goes right across the vehicle. That's obviously because we don't have a real roof in here. So even if you get the hard top, it's not structural. This is what's giving the vehicle structural rigidity. We find some speakers in there, four map lights, which is kind of an interesting touch. And taller drivers should definitely keep in mind that you might end up bopping your head right there on that. So definitely keep that one in mind. We have height adjustable shoulder belts for the driver and front passenger. Over on the front doors, we have a decent amount of soft touch materials on the upper section of the doors, harder plastics down below, just as you'd expect. No bottle holders or anything, but we do have a bit of webbing down there to hold anything that you might want to keep in place. 
As you'd expect out of a vehicle with off-roading in mind, there are a bunch of different places where the passenger can hold on. We have a handle right there on the A-pillar, on the door, and then this large structural one right here as part of the dashboard. That's a nice touch. We have a surprisingly tiny glove compartment over here on this side, and that's because the speaker is over here in the dashboard. The door obviously comes off, so if you want tunes while the door is off, you have to have the speaker in the dashboard. There's also one right up there at the top of the dash. This has the upgraded stitch dash, which really dresses things up, but we find a smaller LCD infotainment system in here than we find in the new Ford Bronco. It supports Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. We have two large round air vents on each side. The controls for the dual zone automatic climate control that this model has. We also have controls for the heated seats there. This button controls the regeneration for the electric drivetrain. Max regen is enabled when we hit that little button right there. Otherwise, it's in regular mode. Controls for the window switches, 12 volt power port, one USB input for the media system, either regular USB or USB-C. There's another one on the center console pretty traditional console shifter there, and a very, very traditional four-wheel drive shifter. You can choose between four high part-time, four high auto, two high, or of course, four low. There's also a neutral mode, so if you want to flat tow this, that is definitely something you can do. We have a handbrake right there, two large cup holders, softly padded armrest, that opens to reveal a two-tiered storage cubby where you could definitely keep a lot of other things, and there's another USB port inside, so you don't have to worry about your smartphone getting flung off into the wilderness if you're driving a little bit more aggressively on that trail. The instrument cluster features a power and charge gauge on the right side, tachometer on the left, and a multifunction LCD right in the middle that gives us a little bit of hybrid information. For additional information, you can consult the infotainment system right here in the center of the dash. We have a three-spoke steering wheel design. Volume controls and track forward, backward are on the back of the steering wheel. Controls that multifunction LCD are on the front left of the wheel, along with some dedicated phone hang-up and pickup buttons. On this side, we find the controls for the optional radar adaptive cruise control system. The steering wheel is a round three-spoke design. The foldable windshield, removable doors, and convertible top have long cemented the Wrangler as the ultimate weekend fun vehicle. And to make that weekend fun happen a little bit more easily, Jeep even gives you a little tool set so that way you can DIY, remove the doors, windshield, etc. The kit contains the right Torx bit and the right socket to remove critical bits of this vehicle. They include the hard top, the soft top, this soft top can come completely off the vehicle, or you can just fold it back right like that. You can also get a powered soft top, which I think is my favorite top. But you should know that not all is exactly easy with the Wrangler. This definitely requires some time. And if you have the hard top version of the Wrangler and you take the top off, you have to put it somewhere that somewhere would be the cargo area or at home. Same thing with the doors. And if you got caught in a rainstorm, obviously that's gonna be a bit of a problem. That's why it seems like a lot of people don't necessarily leave those components off for too long. It also takes a bit of time to fold and unfold the soft top. This isn't too bad. Of course, if you're shorter than me, this could be a bit of a problem. We then pop in here, latch the roof back into place up front with these two clips. We can then come back here, lock the soft top into place with a little lock lever right there. Then we have to attempt to install the sides. Now, these are obviously not powered and this does not move like your average convertible top where everything folds up neatly. You actually have to remove these side pieces yourself. So let's go ahead and install those now. The first thing we do is thread the side into place right up there up top then sort of align it right there into the rear, lock the top into place, and then we tuck the plastic strips under the appropriate channels all around the body here, and then just in front, getting that in the right spot. There's also a little bit of Velcro involved. We then have to thread the other side on in exactly the same manner, then lock that into place there. One thing to keep in mind is that as with many things in life, disassembly seems to be a little bit easier than reassembly, so definitely keep that in mind. And now we're at the stage where we definitely have something that's a little bit less practical than other SUVs that have a regular hardtop. You'll notice it's a pretty wide cargo opening here, but the only metal part to this body is the rear hatch right there that swings to the side. Now, this top snaps in place right like that, then makes a watertight connection with the hatch right there, then you have to seal up these sides. So it means that if you do wanna get cargo in and out of here regularly, you might want to consider one of the other tops. First, let's talk about the hybrid system's drive modes. There are basically four different drive modes. We have hybrid, electric, e-save, and I guess you'd say e-save charge. 
Hybrid's pretty easy to explain. It's going to use the gasoline engine or the electric motor, depending on the state of charge of the battery and how aggressive you are on the accelerator pedal. If I put it over here in electric only mode, it's going to be more aggressive at only using that 134 horsepower electric motor. But if you are really demanding more acceleration, if you're going up a steep slope for a really long period of time, it will turn on the gasoline engine. E-Save is also pretty self-explanatory. It saves the battery for later. And E-Save with charge, same thing. It charges the battery. Not exactly a drive mode, but definitely another button here in the dash is the max regen mode. This is a really handy feature because in off-road situations, especially just trail work like the one that I'm on here, you'll really notice that this keeps your speed in check without having to engage for low. And then of course we have a four low, something that's really, really quite unique in an electrified vehicle. And we engage it in basically the same way that we do in a wide variety of other vehicles. So I simply put it neutral, pull it all the way back there, actually make sure it's in four low according to the display, and then move the selector back to drive. And now we're in four low. And now you'll really hear the electric motor because it's gonna be spinning much faster. You'll also feel that the power is still going through the eight speed automatic transmission. And that definitely makes this different than some plug-in hybrids on the market. One complaint that I have about the four by E is that in the four low mode, they don't seem to change the throttle mapping at all. And that can result in this feeling a little bit herky jerky until you really get used to the way that this pedal operates. With 375 horsepower on tap, zero to 60 is definitely swift for a Wrangler. This goes zero to 60 in six seconds, making this historically one of the fastest Wranglers available. Now, of course, if you want the fastest Wrangler available, that will now be the new model with the 6.4 liter V8. I'll go ahead and close the windows here so it's a teeny bit quieter inside. But strangely enough, the extra weight didn't hamper the driving dynamics quite as much as I thought they might. This particular model took 122 feet to stop from 60 miles an hour back to zero. That's a pretty respectable stopping distance, considering that this weighs 500 to 700 pounds more than a regular Wrangler with a two liter turbo, depending on exactly which options you've selected. Now, even out on this hilly climb, if I go ahead and engage the electric mode, it doesn't feel any different when the gasoline engine turns off. It's a really smooth transition, and there's certainly enough power to get me up this hill. But if I start digging into it a little bit deeper, about 50% of total output, according to this display, is all you can get in electric only mode. It's enough for me to accelerate up this hill, but if I do it for too long, or if I floor it, it's gonna turn on the gasoline engine to give me the most acceleration. So it is possible to keep it in EV only mode as long as you're gentle on the throttle. Gentle is definitely key. Let's roll through the rest of the scores for the Wrangler. Obviously, this is not gonna be the on-road handling champion, so I'm gonna go ahead and give this a B- minus when it comes to handling. I have to say that the Sahara trim and the high altitude trim and even the base trim handle better than you might expect, better than previous generations of the Wrangler. But it's also very clear that a Grand Cherokee is gonna handle better. Some versions of competitive vehicles are gonna handle better, a 4Runner, et cetera, although they're not quite the same thing as the Wrangler. So personally, I don't find that to be a problem at all. The Wrangler does have a reasonable ride, and you will certainly find a better ride in the four-door model because of the longer wheelbase, the higher curb weight, etc. One thing that I found really interesting is that in lower speed situations, like the downhill slopes that I'm on here on this trail, you'll notice that you're not getting a whole lot of regen braking at those lower speeds. Most of the regen happens at higher speeds, say above 10, 15 miles an hour or so. Down here at around nine miles an hour, five miles an hour, even when you're applying the brakes, you're not getting a whole lot of regen ability. And I think that was mainly due to the desire to make the brakes feel very predictable out on trails. You certainly seem to get a little bit more regen braking in four low because of the ratios involved there. But if I'm in four high and we're going down some of these other slopes, I'm just tapping on the brakes very lightly. There's not a whole lot of regen going on. It's depending on the friction brakes. For the climb back up the hill, I've put the vehicle in e-save mode and you'll notice you don't hear the gasoline engine yet. That's because I'm going very slowly, I'm going about four miles an hour right now. And because this vehicle does not have a torque converter, it depends entirely on the electric motor for low speed travel. So zero to say a few miles an hour, it has to use only the electric motor, but it has to turn on the gasoline engine if there's no battery power. And you'll really notice that if I start trying to go super slow up this hill, we get nothing, we then push a little bit more, we get the gasoline engine on, and if you're going up slopes like this when the gasoline is already on, it kind of has this clutch shutter a little bit like a manual transmission vehicle until it decides either it wants the gasoline engine or it just turns it off right like it did there. Now, if you're commanding more, it's gonna have to turn it on. And you will get this moment where you can get a little bit of unexpected slip as the gasoline engine turns on and that clutch engages. So as far as drivetrain smoothness goes, this is not going to be quite as smooth as some of the other Jeeps 
with a regular automatic transmission. There are a few compromises for the electrified nature. If you're concerned about what I mentioned before about transitions between electric operation and hybrid operation when the clutch can close and the gasoline engine can get involved, then you should know that when you're in four low, that speed where the clutch can engage gets effectively cut either by nearly three or by four, depending on the two-speed transfer case that you get. So in this four low mode, you can feel the clutch engage just about between one and two miles an hour. So the engagement is definitely going to be a little bit smoother. And then in this mode, it's going to feel oddly a little bit less herky-jerky than it does in electric mode in four low, simply because of the way the gasoline engine delivers power. It's going to feel a little bit more predictable, a little bit more normal. And it definitely sounds exactly like a regular Wrangler with a two liter engine. Out on really rough asphalt or rough concrete, etc., the cabin is definitely noisy. At 50 miles an hour, I measured 74 and a half decibels in here, making this one of the loudest vehicles that I've tested. If you get the hard top, things are a little bit quieter. They're also going to be a little bit cooler in here. In hot weather, this black top gets really, really toasty. Uh, earlier this week, it actually happens to be 50 and foggy right now, but earlier this week, it was over 100 degrees and I felt like I was baking my head in the car. Now let's dive into the tricky subject of fuel economy. Over my week of mixed driving, I've been averaging about 21 miles per gallon when driving this just as a regular hybrid, not plugging it in at all. In my EV route test, I was able to get 23 miles of electric range, so just over the rated EPA range for this vehicle. Keep in mind, I am driving the Sahara version. If you drive the Rubicon version, expect that number to drop down just because of the tires and everything that goes into making that Rubicon a little bit different. If you're doing a lot of in-city driving or a lot of steady state lower speed driving, say 50 to 55 miles an hour, you could logically expect your range to be a little bit longer and you could expect your fuel economy to be a little bit better. Although some folks might not be too impressed with my fuel economy average, keep in mind that if you were to get the regular two liter turbo without the hybrid system, it's gonna be lower. Your fuel economy will vary greatly based on your terrain, the speed that you're driving, and how often you're able to plug in the vehicle. I have to say I'm a little bit torn on the fuel economy front. Jeep logically could have made some changes that would have improved the fuel economy in this vehicle. They could have tweaked the engine. They could have given it a naturally aspirated two liter four cylinder engine instead but then they would have given off some off-road ability because if you don't have the battery fully charged and you're simply depending on the engine for the oomph off-roading, you really want the extra torque. And running on an Atkinson cycle, not having the turbocharged engine, et cetera, all of that would decrease the available torque and that would mean this wouldn't be quite as good off-road. I'll let you all battle this out down there in the comment section below, but contrary to what Jeep seems to be advertising, I don't think the best use case for this is electric off-roading. I think it's actually just your daily commute. The average American drives less than 22 miles round trip every day. And even though I drive a little bit over that, about 26 to 27 miles each way every day, if I could charge this on both sides, I would still be able to significantly reduce my fuel consumption and I would have a rugged off-road vehicle to boot. So if you're the kind of person that wants an off-road vehicle, wants to be able to go to the off-road park, wants to be able to have that kind of adventure or simply likes the style of this, but you feel a little bit guilty about the gasoline consumption and you get your power from a clean source, keep that in mind, then you could move to something like this. And even though this is using a lot of power versus a really, really efficient EV, you can still have your Wrangler and drive it for 22 miles on electricity. Now on my daily commute, again, I drive a little bit further than this can handle in electric mode each direction, but I can charge at home and I can charge at the office. For me, in a comparable Wrangler, I would generally be getting about 16 miles per gallon because I do go up and over a 2200 foot mountain pass. This vehicle will get a little over 20 miles per gallon in daily driving on my average commute and 44 miles of my daily about 48 to 50 mile commute would be in electricity only. So my gasoline consumption would fall positively through the floor. Now let's run through the pricing. At the moment, the Wrangler 4xe is available in Sahara, Rubicon, and high altitude trims. The high altitude is the most expensive. Sahara is the least expensive, starting at $49,805. As I would equip it, I think you should get the $595 front cam, the $4,095 sky top that is sort of the most practical top in my mind. It doesn't come completely off the rear like the foldable soft top on this model does, but you can power operate it. I think that is absolutely the best top. 
The soft top on this model is a single layer top. Definitely keep that in mind if you live in a hotter climate, especially if you're taking a look at darker colors, you might wanna get the hard top. It's gonna to keep the air conditioning in a little bit better or the heat in the winter. Keyless entry, $695. Blind spot monitoring and parking sensors are an option on the Wrangler. I think they should be standard personally. That's $995, and you will definitely want them on a vehicle that's this big. Again, it's 188 inches long. It's not exactly a small vehicle anymore. Adaptive cruise control with autonomous emergency braking, that's $795. And a really nice touch with the system on the Wrangler is that the radar sensor is actually located right up there behind the windshield, sort of in that area right there, rather than in the front bumper. And that means that if you do plan on putting brush guards, winches, etc., on your Jeep, it's not going to interfere with the operation of that adaptive cruise control sensor. This is a problem I've seen quite a bit in Toyota Tacoma models. They locate their radar sensor in the front bumper. If you put a different bumper on the vehicle, you can get errors. The system may not function properly, etc. I would also get the heated seat option, $995. That brings with it the heated steering wheel. Great for off-roading or in winter conditions, if you have the soft top. $795 buys you the trailering package as well as auxiliary switches and the heavy duty electronics package. That's certainly an option I would get and the rear locker, which this model does not have for $595. All in, my perfect 4xe would be $60,890. That is quite a steep price tag that includes destination but you may qualify for a $7,500 federal tax credit. Now keep in mind, you have to pay the sticker price of the car, then you get $7,500 theoretically back on your federal taxes if you pay at least $7,500 in federal taxes. If your tax liability is below that, you don't get the entire credit and it cannot be rolled over. Bottom line, if you're looking for Wrangler fun and you want to assuage a little bit of guilt by shifting some of your consumption over to electricity, there is quite simply nothing like the Wrangler 4xE on the market just yet. There are some rumors that we might see a hybrid or perhaps a plug-in hybrid version of the Bronco. It's just not on sale at the moment. And any way you slice it, this is going to be lower emissions, generally speaking, than what we see in the Bronco lineup. But it's also worth noting that the Bronco is not exactly the same thing as as the Wrangler. The Bronco is definitely on the large side. That means that even this four-door Wrangler is going to be a little bit more nimble than the four-door Bronco and probably not really far off where we see the two-door Bronco. The two-door Bronco is fairly wide. It also does not have a solid axle up front. Now, personally, I don't necessarily mind an independent front suspension for my kind of off-roading, but if you do really plan on taking your Jeep rock crawling or your Bronco rock crawling, you should keep that solid front axle in mind. It means that the suspension dynamics are going to be different in this than in the Bronco. In all likelihood, the amount of suspension flex that you'll be able to get out of this suspension is gonna be more than we find in the Ford Bronco. I suspect, although I don't have any empirical data for this just yet, because nobody has tested it independently, but I suspect that the Bronco is actually gonna be a little bit more similar to the Forerunner in the way that its front suspension moves, even with the sway bar disconnect feature. It's probably not gonna be quite what we could see in a Wrangler with the appropriate modifications or factory Wranglers with their latest packages because again for 2021 we're gonna have 35 inch tires we're gonna have a little bit of a suspension tweak here and there on that particular package deliberately to beat some of those Bronco numbers but on the other hand the Bronco by all accounts does seem to be more civilized on-road and the Wrangler is really trying to stay true to its off-road mission let me know what you think about all that down there in the comment section below in America right now it's really a two-way race unless you want an electrified off-road vehicle which would be this one. It's really Bronco versus Wrangler. And I love the fact that this is happening. But in a weird sort of twist, not to diss Ford at all, but the reason the Bronco exists is because of the success of this Wrangler right here, the four-door Wrangler model. If they hadn't created a four-door model, they wouldn't be selling over 200,000 Wranglers every year, nearly a quarter million Wranglers in some years over the last five or six years or so. And if it weren't for this kind of success, Ford would not have tried to dip their toes into the water with the all new Bronco. And for that, I'm really, really grateful. I'm glad Ford did it. I'm glad Jeep's doing it. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section below. I'll see all of you later.